with me, Kelly Bazzani, as we go on this epic journey of how to own your power and the steps to take that lead you towards an incredible life of maximum resilience. This educational, powerful, engaging, and inspiring show will change your perception of addiction while we revolutionize the approach that ensures mental health as we address a worldwide epidemic. Let's shift the paradigm promoting mental and emotional wellness. We do recover. Experience the transformation from addiction to living your best life. Here's the secret to learn how to master unleashing your full potential every day in every way. Maximum resilience starts now. I'm telling you, it really does start now. I'm Dr. Pat, and I get to, I don't know how much longer, Benny, I'm going to get the honor of sharing this platform with the most amazing, amazing certified coach beyond even that, the creator of Maximum Resilience, Kelly Bassani. Now, but today is one of those days we get to do it. When I think about people, here's what I think about. I love the people that I get to work with and hang out with. I love the people that are so committed and dedicated to helping this place be a better world that they show up 125 million percent. That's like a number, Benny. But they also show up with powerful messages. So for a show like today, for all of you, if you don't know who Kelly is, you're going to find out today. Besides having a master's in psychology, a certified master life coach, facilitator, content creator, the most amazing person when it comes to understanding the, I'm going to call it the travel log of addiction and recovery. I love that term. Uh, this is what you're going to get today. And because of the nature of the show and the depth and the breadth of what we do, it is also translatable and also transcendent to a conversation today that mindfulness matters. Jessica and I were just all over this a few minutes ago, but I didn't quite explain it. So Jessica's running the show today, so she'll get to hear it. Today, mindfulness matters, the importance of agreements in mastering consciousness. Kelly, right? Yeah. Right? All right. So let's start with the conversation um, about the topic. And uh, how did this hit you? And let's set us up for what people can expect in the show, because this is like a super powerful thing today. Yeah. Thanks, Dr. Pat. I'm super excited about today's show. So Dr. Pat and I are going to speak today about one of our favorite topics. I'm going to say our, um, and follow it up by referencing one of our most favorite books, treasured books and author, Don Miguel Ruiz. Um, it's one of the first assignments I give my coaching clients is um, I give them the book, The Four Agreements, along with my spirit animal, Brene Brown, um, her gifts of imperfection. But we're going to outline the four agreements today. And we're going to put a dynamic spin on how keeping these agreements can result in changeable outcomes, positive or negative, Dr. Pat. We're going to talk about that, favored or not. And what is the impact of keeping these agreements? So how many of you guys wonder out there why you break agreements? That was a really big struggle for me early in my recovery, and especially when I was in my addiction and my alcoholism. So why this is so powerful is that this addictive behavior, because it is an addictive behavior, so we're going to put a little spin on that for you guys today, this can shift on just being mindful, just being mindful and present and staying conscious um, and the actions you can take in your life. So we always think of mindfulness as meditating on a rock or Ming uh, to a Buddha mantra, which is great. I do that as well. You can see me with my little bracelets on. I have my little chakra bracelets on, so we're not dismissing that at, at all. But um, I want to ask, like, we always think of this, and I want to ask the audience, like, how many of you are taking a picture with your family or taking a picture with your significant other, and somebody just, like, walks right in front of the camera, right? Like, raise your hand. Like, and how many of you are laughing because you yourself have done that? Raise your hand because I've done that as well. So I just want to like ha ask you, how does that apply to addiction? And that's what Dr. Pat and I are going to kind of tackle that today because I want to ask the audience, how many of you know exactly why you drink or use substances? Like exactly know why. And I just want to have everybody kind of sit with that for a second because I'm, I'm going to kind of take you through the steps using the four agreements today. Dr. Pat and I are going to do that because yeah. 
we can't recover until we are mindful and conscious of what we're recovering from because we, we go unconscious. And I don't mean like unconscious, like asleep unconscious. I just mean we go unconscious and we break agreements. So I shared a little bit of my story last episode in Mindset Matters. Today we're doing Mindfulness Matters. And I want to share a little bit more before we get into this, Dr. Pat, that I broke my back lifting a patient um, when I was a critical care nurse in 2006. I underwent eight spinal surgeries until 2013 that led to my addiction. And so for me, I was just existing. And I initially used it for physical pain, but then I noticed and I was mindful and aware that I was using it for emotional pain. And so same thing for alcohol. It was fun until it wasn't. So how did that shift, right? So I went from using, thinking about using, recovering from using, to in my mindfulness and keeping agreements to myself and others, to growing, thinking about growing, or resting my body and mind from a huge growth and transformation. So when we're mindful and keeping agreements to ourselves and others, we reduce stress. We enhance performance. We gain insight and awareness through observing our own mind. And we increase attention to others' well being. We can suspend judgment and unleash our natural curiosity about the workings of the mind and approach our experience with warmth and mm -hmm. kindness to ourselves and others. Yeah. So that's going to be like the boom of our show today is going through each one of these agreements and how it applies to our addiction and how we can become mindful and keep our agreements throughout each step. So I'm yeah. super excited to be doing this with you. Super excited to take us through each one step by step using my own personal examples in my addiction and recovery to help guide everybody no matter what stage you're at. And let's do this. I'm super yeah. excited. Look, I love Don Miguel. I actually will call him a friend. And so also of his children. You know, he was one of the first interviews I did when I when I very started. And so can we just recap where we are? For those of you that don't know the four agreements, let me get you there. The four agreements. It's this is the title of the book. It is a book. It's available paperback, Kindle, audiobook, spiral bound. <laughs> Anything you can imagine, you, you can get it. The four agreements, a practical guide to personal freedom. See that now. Right, Kelly, in recovery, we talk about freedom. This book, just on Amazon, sold over 80, it has over 83,000 ratings just on Amazon. And yeah. this is why we're talking about it. Because, Kelly, you got to fill me in on this. This is one of these books. Every time I talk about it, say, I say, I've read it. I've even said to Don Miguel, has anybody been able to do these four agreements other than you? Right. And what I realized in his answer to me was, how did he say it? He talked more about it being a journey and about the intention of it, because that's where the growth is. What is your What are your thoughts on that? And let's get to the first one, right? Yeah. Uh, uh, okay. <laughs> this is a tricky one. This one, right? Let's get to the first one. Be impeccable with your work. Yeah. And, and we'll get to, you know, that's the thing. People look at that. I use it as my Bible, right? I have gone and dove into that book hundreds of millions of times because the goal is not to do it perfectly. And we're going to talk about that in our last segment, which is always do your best. Yep. You're never going to perfectly be impeccable with your work. You're never going to perfectly not take things personally. But the goal is to just do your best with all of these agreements. So thank you for prefacing with that. Yeah. So yeah. the first one that you know, we're both giggling about is being impeccable with your work. That's the first one we're going to talk about, right? And Don Miguel says, with that first one, being, being impeccable with your word is the correct use of your energy. And I love when he talks about that because we talked about this in our first show, like where your attention goes, your energy flows. And so it means to use your energy in the direction of truth and love for yourself first, right? So before you can be impeccable with your word towards others, you have to watch how you're being impeccable with your word to yourself. Are you keeping agreements with yourself first? How are you speaking to yourself first? Are you being impeccable with your word to yourself first? So if you make an agreement with yourself to be impeccable with your word, just with that intention, he says, the truth will manifest through you and clean all the emotional poison that exists within you. Wow. 
wow, right? Like who doesn't <laughs> want that? Who doesn't want that, right? And so we, when we when we talk about that, Dr. Pat, where how I take that into layman's terms for myself, because that's a lot of depth in that one sentence is, be proud of everything that you say. You know, I always tell my clients, be proud of everything you say. And to me, that manifests into integrity of character. So what are you saying to yourself? And is that translating over then into what you're saying to somebody else? So if you're showing truth and love for yourself, you're then showing truth and love for others, right? It's that like, it's that um, law of attraction. And so there we kind of bleed into like the accountability piece. So accountability, I love to say to people like accountability only feels like an attack when the person's not ready to accept and be mindful to see how their behavior is harmful to others. Have you ever had that Dr. Pat where like, you know, someone comes to you and they're like, five years ago when we went fishing, you were kind of impatient with me. And you're like, what? I don't oh, know. No, I, I have a friend of a friend who ruminates about that. And yeah. I'm like, I don't even remember when we went fishing. And right. then you just insult them more because you don't remember that special fishing moment. And you're like, okay, like what decade was that? It just helped me out. I don't know. I can't tell you what I ate for dinner last night. Right. I don't live in that space. But you said something I want to ask you to further define. Yes. There are two sides to this coin. And this is what I love. There's the idea that I am going to be impeccable with my word. But there's the other side of it. There's the receiver of it who knows when we are and knows how it feels when we're not. There are consequences to both behaviors, doing it and not doing it. And I use the word consequences because there are outcomes. Let's just call it outcomes. Yes. You know, if if you can hit the mark more times than not to be impeccable with your word, then the outcomes of that are things like you develop trust, da 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 da. When you're not, what, how, what happens is there are negative consequences. So you're today talking about what happens on both sides of that coin because you mentioned the word accountability. And That's if you're right. going to mention accountability, then we got to talk about a whole lot of outcomes, right? That's right. So for example, that's great. I love how you brought that up. So if I'm living in my integrity of character and I'm saying to you that I'm loyal, I keep my agreements, I'm compassionate, okay? And that's what I'm keeping my agreement. Then you come to me and you say that about the fishing trip. And I'm like, I don't remember that fishing trip. Then I'm not being impeccable with my word of who I say that I am. I'm not keeping that agreement. So all those things go down. Your trust in me goes down. Your, my, your self-worth, your self-confidence, all those things go down. But if I say to you, Dr. Pat, I, I am so sorry. I don't remember that fishing trip. But if you say to me that I hurt you, then I'm so sorry. So I'm compassionate. I'm living in my integrity of character. I'm being loyal to who I am. Then all those things in, in you go up. Your trust in me, your self-worth, your self-confidence and stuff. Because I keep my agreement. I'm being mindful, et cetera. Do you see? So there's how that works on that spectrum. I'm being impeccable with my word. Right? And so there's where it's favored or not, it can have a positive or negative outcome because nobody ever died from swallowing their pride, right? So even though I may not remember that fishing trip, I can't remember what I had for dinner last night, I can still be impeccable with my word to myself, keep my agreement, be mm -hmm. mindful, be conscious of what you're saying to me. And so that accountability only feels like a attack if I'm not willing to admit how that behavior might have been harmful for you. So I'm still living there. Right. So we're free to choose, like you said, but we're not free from the consequence of our choice. So in that moment, I can choose to be impeccable with my word or I can choose to go unconscious and not keep that agreement to myself and to you yeah. to be impeccable with my word. And now let's loop it back because we are talking about mindfulness matters. That is the episode today we're talking about. And I just want to remind everybody that the reason mindfulness matters, and Kelly, you're going to take us on, on the journey of what mindfulness really is, right? It's not what everybody thinks. And you don't have to be on a top, the top, you know, summit of, in Tibet on a mountain. This is something that everyone can do. But what you just talked about really then brings itself forward 
when we start to think about this and we think about accountability and we think about mindfulness matters, this one right here, this one is the giant pothole. Yes. Don't take anything personally. Yes. And that is based off of our first step, right? Because this is why it leads so much to addiction, because we have an addiction and it's called an emotional addiction, right? We get addicted and Doc, and Don Miguel says this so beautifully. And I'm going to start with what I say to my clients, right? Emotional pain is inevitable. Suffering is optional. And so we get to choose to look at the role we play in our own suffering. And this one is hard for people in addiction because we create so much chaotic energy in our addiction. So when we choose to get sober, we're like, what do we do without all these emotional addictions? Okay. And so Don Miguel says, humans are addicted to suffering at different levels and to different degrees. And we support each other in maintaining these addictions. And humans agree to help each other suffer. And so they are asking for justification to their suffering. So their addiction to suffering is nothing but an agreement that is reinforced every day. So we don't consciously pay attention to this sometimes. So you'll notice that people will say sometimes like, well, this is normal. This is normal. You know, I've been in this relationship and I say to people, it may be normal, but it's not healthy. Yeah. Right. And so we we like to look at this in terms of being mindful of you're enabling this behavior because you're also doing the same behavior. Yeah. So I like to go into not taking things personal because you get to trust yourself. A lot of the times you're looking to somebody else for that external validation and they're like, oh, no, I wouldn't wear that. We just went through this today. I mean, it's so okay. funny that we're talking about these things and then, you know, we wake up in the morning and you, you start to, you know, get yourself ready for whatever your day is. And then something shows up that totally leans into what we're talking about. Let me ask you this question because, and I got to reiterate this, see mindfulness matters because it is the gateway to helping us get to be able to do these these four agreements. Yes. So it is that gateway. It's like the bridge, like the bridge, like the four agreements is like over here, over here, like going across the George Washington Bridge, like the four agreements over here, right? And mindfulness is the bridge. Yes. And what you got over here is everything but the four agreements, right? Okay, yes. so like zero over here agreements. And then the four agreements and the bridges, mindfulness matters, right? Yeah. And the reason I want to ask you about this, because talk to the nature of when we take things personally, because in addiction and recovery, this is a thing. And we don't know it. We don't call it out. But outside of addiction and recovery, this is a thing. People take things personally. And Kelly, by the way, social media has not helped with this. No. <laughs> No. And, and I was telling you, Dr. Pat, remember on our call a couple of weeks ago, I was saying, I'll have clients that they'll get suicidal over what they're seeing on social media. They'll say, I saw my boyfriend and he was in front of this big house in this big car and he's moved on without me and he's living his best life. And I'm like, time out. Right. And then we'll find out that the boyfriend is in front of somebody else's house and car. Right. But they're looking at something and taking that personal without testing the evidence. Did you directly talk to your boyfriend and know what your boyfriend is doing? Right. And so we're, we're choosing to believe or not believe what someone says to you. As your mindfulness and awareness grows, you get to choose to trust what is your inner knowing telling you rather than basing it off of what somebody else is saying, where they might be lying to themselves about what the actual capital T truth is. My master life coach would always say to me, it's your truth, but is it the capital T truth, right? And so when you don't take things personally, you avoid many upsets in your life, anger, jealousy, you know, all these different things that are happening, sadness, and you experience freedom like you were talking about, and you do not place your trust in what others are saying or doing. 
So you get to go into this problem solution for yourself, which I love to teach my clients, which is like, how do you, it, you come back to yourself, how do you contribute to the problem by either your reaction or your inaction when the problem is occurring? So I love the example. I, I want to, you know, I always like to use myself in, as an example. So I'm not just sitting here like, yeah. and then we do this step and then we do this right, step. Right. So early in my recovery, you know, I was, you know, I'm going to my parents' house early in my sobriety. Right. So my reaction is, why are they drinking when I'm sober? You know, why don't they have any non alcoholic drinks there that I like to drink? Why did nobody ask me, you know, what's my sensitivity around drinking? So there's my reaction. You know, then my inaction is, why didn't I say anything about how I was going to feel? Why didn't I call my mom and dad and tell them what alcohol, non alcoholic drinks I would like there? My inaction, why didn't I set boundaries around the time I was going to show up and the time, right? So I go there instead of taking things personally and sitting there in my gunk, right? And and so there's where I can get it back to me and trust myself to know what action I can take. And then I don't take things personally, right? So I leave behind all that sadness, all that resentment, all that MV that everybody else is drinking and, and I bring it back to myself. Okay. So I never spoke up. So I don't, but I don't know any of that. If I'm not mindful and conscious and keeping my agreements to myself around my own sobriety, and then I'm not taking it personally. So yeah. I love that. And we go back to the step one of, am I being impeccable with my word and in my integrity of character? So it all fits together there. So I yeah. love this agreement because it's so difficult. I remember early in my sobriety, my sponsor's like, what other people think about you is none of your business. And I'm like, but, <laughs> but, you know, I used to get so irritated. She's like, it's none of your business. And I'm like, mm -hmm. but, because it's just human nature that you want people to like you. You know, you want people to have a good, but when you're setting boundaries and you're early in recovery and you're so worried about it, it forms those core beliefs those yeah. negative ones. And so it's really important because all that emotional poison is getting in and it's forming how you're making agreements or more importantly, how you're breaking agreements to yourself based on what other people are thinking. Yeah. I love and the way Don Miguel talks about this early on in the book because he really lays the blueprint out and he hits you right up. Really, he hit, it felt like he was hitting me right up the side of the head. You know, when you open the book and you're just getting warmed up, and he says, the belief system is like a book of law that rules our mind. Yes. And he goes on to talk about this. Uh, and he, what he's saying about the book of law is it doesn't matter what's in your book of law. Whatever is in the book of law is your truth. Yes. Yeah, your, your book of law could be different than mine. But whatever is in here about my belief system, that's it. And, and it ties into what you're talking about, because all of this that we're talking about, in order to be able to get this aspect, Kelly, down, this second agreement now, we have to build up a level of resilience here. You know, yeah. we have to look at mindfulness matters because, and if you want to open that door to freedom, then this is what we have to learn. Um, I want to take a short break if we could. But before we do, Kelly, can you just take a moment and just let everybody know how they can find out more about you? Tell us a little bit about the work you're doing with others in this area. Yeah, you guys can find me at www.myresiliencecoach.com. And um, Dr. Pat's beautiful um, colleague, Jessica, has rebuilt my website and added my media page where you can um, book me for speaking engagements now. She has also updated um, my website so you can find all of my information there. Um, so you can book me for speaking engagements. You can find me for group coaching packages and for my one-on-ones. So you can find all of the information where we cover all this master empowerment coaching. Um, and I'm speaking at a broader level to cover all these topics. So we're yeah. super excited to be expanding. Yeah. And by the way, this, we're doing a whole series on this because you all have asked for it. You know, we, we don't just randomly come up and say, oh, let's talk about this today. You know, there is clearly a method to what we're doing. So what Kelly has done is she has created now, this is the second conversation we have because 
when we're looking at mindfulness, it does matter. And when we come back, you're going to find out why. Because here's the deal with what she's saying. And it's like Don Miguel says, there's something in our mind that judges everybody and everything. It's there. And that's what he calls this thing, the inner judge, it is what we use in the book of law. But how does that help us cross that bridge as we were talking about? How does it help us get from all of this stuff that is just not working in our lives to the other side, which we are going to call freedom? So when we come back, we're going to take a little trip down the road of what? This one right here. How many of you know what that third agreement is? How many of you know what the third agreement is? And boy, pick which one of these is difficult for you. When we come back, it's that third agreement, but... What does mindfulness matters have to do to help you with this one? Wait till you hear what Kelly has to say about it. Let's go to a short break. Benny, Jessica, you all will be right back. All clear.
Ready to come back? Stand by. Hey, everybody, welcome back. It's so great to have all of you tune us in and turn us on. And just want to remind everybody, you are listening to Maximum Resilience with Kelly Bozzani. And I'm Dr. Pat. I get to take a little bit of this journey with her for the moment. Um, Kelly is bringing to the conversation mindfulness. Mindfulness matters. That's the conversation today. But in order for us to really build a bridge and explain the importance of this. I think what Kelly has done to really look at the book, The Four Agreements by Don Miguel and say, look, let's take a look at mindfulness as the bridge. And let's take a look at these four agreements. Because what Don Miguel says is that these four agreements are pathway to freedom. And that's where we started. We're going to get ready to talk about number three, which is don't make assumptions. But before we do that, uh, Kelly, give out your website one more time if you could. Sure. It is www.myresiliencecoach.com. Okay. Look, in thinking about this, you know, we've so far what we've talked about for those of you out there, be impeccable with your word. That's what we talked about at the beginning. And you'll, you know, that has to do with mindfulness and we'll, we'll be able to tell you how these all tie together. Then the next one is don't take anything personally. So about why mindfulness matters. Now, this one's a little bit trickier, but Kelly is going to bring it on. Don't make assumptions. And Kelly, let's talk about this, because this is the one where people don't really connect the dots very well for mindfulness, but it is essentially there, isn't it? Yes, it's so essential. And I want to just be really clear that I work on these every day myself um, in my mindfulness. But Don Miguel says, the problem with making assumptions is we believe them to be the truth. And we talked about this a little bit in segment two. Um, We make assumptions about not only what people are thinking, but what they are doing. And this becomes a a big problem, not only in recovery, but um, in our addictions. And so when we um, assume what other people are thinking or doing, then we blame them. And then we react. Uh, by sending emotional poison with our word. And so I don't need to say on air that that's, this can become a huge chaotic mess, not only for ourselves, but for the person that we are um, sending that emotional poison to. So um, we know the old phrase, you know, when we assume we, you know, boom, boom out of you and me, but that is still the truth with all this. So we make an assumption, we misunderstand, We take it personal, step two, and we end up creating internal and external conflict for nothing. Absolutely nothing. But it kind of goes with how we are in our addiction, right? We're we're just creating kind of, at least I was, I was creating chaos wherever I went. So um, what I am really, if anything, we take from this show today is have the courage to ask questions right? Make sure the communication is clear. What I always say to my clients is be inquisitory, not accusatory. Because by the time, you know, I always say to my clients, sometimes we don't have the closure we need. So then we make up the communication in our mind, right? So Dr. Pat, you and I are friends, let's say. Well, we are friends, but we're just doing the scenario. Yeah. He's not communicating with me because she needs a minute. She needs her or whatever. So because I don't have the communication, I'm over here and I'm making up a scenario in my mind because it helps with my pain. It helps with my discomfort or whatever. So I'm like, she's over there doing her Dr. Pat show. Well, she's nice and happy. Well, she's busy. That's why she's not communicating with me. Right. So I'm over here making all these assumptions without any communication. So I'm blaming her. I'm making assumptions. I'm doing everything. So by the time I actually get a chance to communicate with Dr. Pat, I'm being accusatory with you statements, not I statements. You don't have time. (laughs) You're busy with your show, but right. I'm spitting this emotional poison, which isn't healthy for me. It's right. And now if you see, I'm bleeding into segment two, I'm taking things personally. I'm not being impeccable with my word. And it's just a hot mess express over at Dr. Pat. Now, how do you feel Dr. Pat's going to respond to that. Not very well, right? As opposed to, I'm inquisitory. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Because I'm going to take it personally. So there we go with that. 
Right? right. So then instead, I'm inquisitory using I statements. Dr. Pat, I'm just curious. I don't feel like things went really well the last time we spoke. I was just wondering if you have time to have a conversation. I don't feel like I was clear in my communication. I don't feel like my perspective was probably the best on this because I was angry and upset, whatever the case may be. Yeah. Right? Huge difference in the way that I'm not making any assumptions. I'm not like blame shifting. I'm not gaslighting. I'm not like spitting emotional poison over there. Okay. So when you stop making assumptions and you communicate clearly and you're free of that emotional poison, your word becomes impeccable. So when we're clear and specific, so I just want to kind of bleed in a little bit that my, one of my favorite authors, um, who is Bessel van der Kolk, he writes how the body keeps score. He says, trauma is a reaction, not a memory. And at first I was like, uh, I don't know. And then when I thought about it, I'm like, absolutely. So Dr. Pat and I have a disagreement. She says something right? At first I react. I'm like, right? Because she is not my trigger. Let me just be very clear. And let me be clear about one more thing too, because I'm so passionate about this subject. So please rewatch this as many times as you need to, because it took me years to learn this. And I want to take you through a shorter amount of pain and a shorter amount of time. Your triggers are your responsibilities not the other person's responsibilities. So Dr. Pat says something to me. I get triggered. Dr. Pat is not my trigger. What she said was the trigger. Maybe her tone was the trigger. Okay. But I react to it. And then it brings me back to the memory that is the trigger. Okay. So your trigger is an unwanted emotional or behavioral response. Okay. And so at that moment, then if you're mindful of this, this is where we get into the mindfulness matters. You have the opportunity then to ask questions and walk your way to a different ending. If you are not mindful of this and you go unconscious, right, you're going to keep repeating the same patterns over and over, but with a different person and a different experience until the lesson is learned and you become conscious of it. Okay. So this is where this is like really important. So I want to give a personal example, Dr. Pat, unless you want to add. No, let's do it. Let's do it. Because this is the one thing I think right here, this one really touches on the others, but it's the one that can be the silent killer. The assumption one is the silent killer, right? Would you agree? Uh, Absolutely. And it took me years to learn it, but I'm so mindful and aware of it now that I have ended, like, I don't do this in my world anymore, right? Like, if I notice this and I see friendships keep repeating this pattern, and I'm like, hey, I'm just curious, I'm noticing this, and they're, like, not mindful, and I'm having, I'm like, I'm sorry, I love you, but I'm going to have to love you from a distance, right? Because it's, it's emotional poison, right? So my example that I am so mindful of and I continue to keep working on is my father, as a child, I was always seeking external validation from my dad, right? I wanted him to notice me. I wanted him to pay attention. My mother was always overly nurturing, telling me how beautiful I was and lovely and this and that, okay? So therefore, I'm always aware and mindful of how I am triggered by people's responses to me because I know how I show up for people, okay? So if I respond to people with this long, supportive, nurturing text, like my mother would send, okay, to people, and I get a thank you. So if I'm like, Dr. Pat, thank you so much for that wonderful phone conversation. You're the most supportive mentor. I appreciate you so much. that, Like my mother would send to me, And I get a thank you from you, like my dad would send when I was a kid. I am aware and mindful of how that is triggering for me, okay? So I need to be aware of how it triggers my need for my dad external validation trigger. Yeah. 
Okay. So I can't assume or take it personal that just because I didn't get a long nurturing text back from you, that you don't love me just as much as I love you. Okay. That is an example of that. So, but that is my responsibility that I can't wait and take that personally and just wait for you to send this long nurturing text. So the next time we get on a zoom, I'm like, yeah. (laughs) And you know, it's tricky ground, isn't it? Because what you're talking about really has to do with our own introspective, you know, evaluation we do of ourselves. Yeah. And the reason we have to do that is because you cannot expect other people to understand the personality styles of every single person that they're up against. And although I will tell you, I have learned a little bit more that there are some people, all they want is a thank you and do not give me three sentences. And, you know, you have to really understand this. Some days, and we're going to talk about this next, some days you may be right on spot with doing it. But let me ask you this question. There's an important reason why we're talking about this. Because if you don't get these down right now, there is a behavior that you will take which will either get you to freedom or get you to victimization. Yeah. Uh, it is a get you to move on a path to yeah. recovery or you will be back in you know where. Yes, you're absolutely correct. And that's what I was referring to. At some point when you keep getting the same results that you've been getting, you have to take a look at that and go, huh, I'm the common denominator in either the victim mindset where I continue to keep feeling powerless over people, places, and circumstances, or I've stepped into my power. And in that example you just gave, that's okay if you're one of those people that need more than one or two sentences. But it is our responsibility to ask (laughs) for what we want and need and make a request. Oh my gosh, I just went through this crazy over the stupidest thing this weekend. I can't mention the name on air, but I go to this one pizza place to get their salad. And the salad that I get is not even on the menu anymore. And I'm like, what? Instead of that Greek salad, which I love, and then you could put your own stuff in it. And I get a giant one and it like lasts me and I have it like with other stuff, right? It's like this delicious, like Greek salad thing. And I go to order and it's like, wait, you replaced my Greek salad with like some salad with strawberries in it. Are you kidding me? (laughs) And, and, but, but you see where you go. And then I go, oh, you can't order the Greek thing online. So then I go in and I'm like, okay, can I have the Greek salad? Cause it's like not on your menu anymore. And they say, that's right. It's not on our menu anymore. And I'm like, well, can I have the Greek salad? But it's not on our menu anymore. And so you could, you could see the dialogue, right? Yep. Then I have to get the mindfulness gene that kicks in. Yes. And I say, okay, can you build me a salad that was like that Greek salad? Yep. Yes. Do you don't call it the Greek example? salad. I don't care what you call it. Yeah. Just give me a giant, gigantic thing that they make of that salad. But you could see that in that moment, that could have went really sideways. And that's Absolutely. a simple little thing, Kelly. Absolutely. But you <laughs> see how you just like went through the steps we were talking about. So there was a problem. You had a reaction and you had some inaction, right? You're like, oh. But then you went in and you were inquisitory instead of accusatory. I'm just curious. Can you build me a salad? Like the Greek one. The Greek one? You weren't like, you're an idiot. You don't have the, you know what I'm saying? Like, so you're mindful and you keep in alignment. You're impeccable with your word about who you are as a person. How do I want to show up? I want to be proud of everything that I say. Right. But if you go in and you're like, my perspective is the only perspective. I'm sorry. I don't agree with you. You're going to keep getting the same results you've always gotten, which is not good. Yeah. Right. But that leads to this last thing, which really is important in all of this, because the next part of that conversation with the salad was, well, can you tell me what's in the Greek salad? And like, this is the person that makes the salads. Yeah. Can you tell me what's in the Greek salad? Okay, because it's not on the board anymore. It's like, I don't know where the Greek salad went. And they got all their stuff in front of them. And I said, I had that moment. See, always do your best. Always do your best. 
Yes. And I said to him, because I was, I was studying for this show, I said, you know, I will try my best. I will do my best to do that. And off we went. But see, this is it. Always do your best. It doesn't, it doesn't say always do it to perfection. No. Right? But this one right here, this is a game changer. Yes. This is... I, I almost love this one the best because it encompasses the, all the three other ones, right? And this is where I see a lot of my clients um, pause. And I saw myself pause as I did the steps in recovery. You know, you see people get to the fourth step in recovery, myself included, and I took a minute or my clients get to my paradigms and they stop because if they can't do it perfectly, they're like, ah, Right. So I love this. So it says, you know, when you do your best, you learn to accept yourself. Acceptance. I, I remember talking in my first show about like, this is what we're going to do, right? We're going to take my story. We're going to go back and learn about the acceptance. When I got into acceptance and didn't resist decisions I had made, took accountability for everything, get to the president and how we maintain that resilience. So when you do your best, you learn to accept yourself, but you have to be aware and learn from your mistakes. Yeah. People don't want to look at their mistakes. They're like, right. And a great example I want to give Dr. Pat is for anybody that has children or have been around children or things like that. I myself don't have children. So I like to use the example of this, but when you have children and your child comes up to you and they're like, mom, 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 mom. <laughs> Right. Like what's going to happen if you don't acknowledge that child? They're going to keep going like bah, 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 until you look at your child and you say, I see you. I hear you. And I acknowledge you. Right. And then your child's going to go play and they're going to do their thing and they might come back and go. Bah, 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 bah. And then you acknowledge, I see you. I hear you. That's like your mistakes. OK. Yeah. Well, yeah. Until you look at them and you see, I see you, I hear you, I acknowledge you, right? They might come back, right? But that's what I really want to encourage people to do because the more you resist it, whether it be a physical ailment, whether it be a mistake you made, whether it be a pattern you keep repeating, whether it be your addiction or alcoholism, put your arm around it, embrace it and be like, you're part of me. I love you. I accept mm -hmm. you. And boom. Right. Because the minute you start doing that, you learn to accept yourself. All yeah. of you. Well, so, let's, let's talk about this in terms of recovery, too, because yeah. I know you're going to give us a page out of the big book. Oh, yes. OK. So yeah. because what you're what I hear you saying is the word accept. So I want to get to acceptance because, you know, Don Miguel doesn't say it, but acceptance is built in each one of those four agreements. And it's also built in, you know, this idea of mindfulness matters is it matters because it gives you a neutral place to go. It doesn't mean you're not going to ruminate about fears and things, right? That's not what it means. But let's talk about this thing called acceptance, because this now applies whether you're in recovery or not in recovery. This, this right here, what we're about to talk about. Go ahead. Tell us about it. All of it. So learning from your mistakes means you practice, look honestly at the results, whether they're good or bad, and keep practicing. So that right there, that right there will increase your mindfulness and your awareness. So doing your best is taking the action because you want to. I, I need to make that very clear because you want to and love it. Not because you're getting an award, expecting a reward or an accolade, because then you have an expectation. And I want to get into that, you know, if you have an expectation and don't enjoy the action, then you're going to meet that resistance. And it becomes a have to instead of a want to or get to. And it leads to a resentment. And Dr. Pat, you know, as well as I do, when, when you're made to have to do something, it, it makes me feel resentful or it makes me feel kind of angry as opposed to if I want to do something or I get to do something. Yeah. So, right. This weekend for me, let's just get real about it. Yeah. This weekend for me, right. Uh, you and I work. Yep. We work. We're working people. We have Absolutely. our own businesses. We're doing that. Yeah. Who knows when we need to be on call or what we need to do. Yep. I realized to me, I had was just right smack in the middle of that thing. So move, let's move beyond the Greek salad. 
because this was this weekend for me. And it's not a surprise, Kelly, because yeah. I'm getting ready for this show. So it's like straight up in my face. So what's the other resentment? I got to clean my house. OK, that's number one. What's the second one? Oh, my God, I got to cut my grass and weed whack it because the person that did this is no longer available. So yeah. now here I am. I just want to go play ping pong, but I go play ping pong. And all I could think about is I should be home cutting my grass. Now, what happened with that was I came home and I started to do some stuff. My neighbor comes over and says, what are you doing? I said, I'm cutting my grass. He said, why? Wait till it gets to be 71 degrees next week. Yep. And I said, you know how fogged up my whole thinking was? Because why? Resentment was driving me. Yes. Over cutting the grass, which half of it is burnt out already, people that live here. And then cleaning my house. And you know what? I don't mind cleaning Kelly. I, Kelly, look, I know how to clean with the toothbrush from grandma. But yeah. here's what I want to say. You got to take this away now because I couldn't get someone to come to take care of this for me. That's right. But boy, let me just get a resentment about it. That's better. That's right. Because you get on the autopilot, right? So action is about living fully. Inaction is the way that we deny life. So if we're doing our best, the first three agreements will only work if you do your best. Not perfectly, Dr. Pat, not on autopilot thinking you got to be your own CEO, lawnmower, weed whacker, table tennis player. Okay. So I'm a weed whacking table tennis player. Right. And I do the same thing. That's why I'm saying it to you. So we can both <laughs> listen to our own words of advice here. Right. Routine habits. This is what I'm going to say to you. Routine habits are too strong and firmly rooted in our minds. That's why you were doing what you were doing and I'm doing what I'm doing. Right. So don't expect that you will never take anything personally. Just do your best. Don't expect that you will never make another assumption, but we can certainly do our best. Don't expect that you will never make, you know, another assumption. Oh, I, I already covered that. I guess I'm saying it twice because that's the one I need to work Just on. get it in there. Right? So if we are mindful and do our best over and over again, we will become a master of transformation. That is what I want to take home here, right? If we do our best in search of personal freedom, in search of self-love, without judgment of, of ourselves or criticism of our own journey, we will find what we are looking for. So my favorite quote from Brene Brown, my spirit animal is, I'm a recovering perfectionist and an aspiring good enoughist, right? And so page 417 of the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, I read this every night before I go to bed, says, and acceptance is the answer to all of my problems today. When I am disturbed, it is because I find some person, place, thing, or situation, some fact of my life unacceptable to me. And I can find no serenity until I accept that person, place, thing, or situation as being exactly the way it is supposed to be at this moment. Present, conscious, mindful in this moment. So there are three things, Dr. Pat, we can control. The thoughts we think, the words we speak, and the actions we take. So being mindful of those things are really the most important takeaway and like you said, that can keep us in a victim mindset, the thoughts we think, the words we speak, and the actions we take, or it can make us in the thrive mentality with the thoughts we think, the words we speak, actions we take. And isn't that the core of mindfulness? I mean, isn't that the core? Isn't that, you know, to bring it full circle, let's bring it full circle in the, in the, in the couple, in the minute we have left. But the full circle is that mindfulness is that bridge, isn't it? That is the bridge over. And I just want to like lead us out into our next episode with um, Nancy McFadden and a client shared this with me because I was sharing something and she's like, oh, and I just, I think this like summarizes it for us. She says, I hope you live life not for the accolades, but for the experience itself. Climb the mountain, not to plant the flag, but to embrace the challenge, enjoy the air and behold the view. Climb it so you can see the world and not so the world can see you. I hope you don't let fear stop you. I hope you take a pause 
every so often. And I wish you so much more than luck, right? It's not so we get an award. It's not so we do this mindfulness work and being present so that we can get to the top and go, wow, look at everything I overcame. I kept practicing. I kept looking at my patterns. I kept wanting to be impeccable of my word. I kept practicing not making assumptions. I kept practicing not taking things personally. And now my life looks so much better and I feel so much more alive and free because of it.